He had written seven scripts that were sitting in a stack in the corner of his studio apartment that not a single human had read. J.F. Lawton had been writing screenplays and trying to break into Hollywood for years. Do you think that would have happened if he hadn't met you? My belief is that J.F. Lawton was so profoundly talented. I see this in a number of people in front of and behind the camera that eventually I have to, I hope and believe that he would have made it. But one of the things I would say is at the time I was more manager than producer when I met him, lit manager. And you're right, he had, uh, you know, he was living in a one room studio apartment in the Rampart District of Hollywood. Back then, a very, let's just say, colorful, if not dangerous, uh, experience on a day to day basis. And he had dropped out of film school. And I'm not sure if I've shared this before, but he, the way we met was I had bought one of the early Macintosh computers. And a screenwriter friend of mine was working on one, but you couldn't just plug them in and work on them. Someone had to program them. And I said, how did you make it work? And they said, hire Jonathan. So I did. Three weeks in my office, full time, round the clock, asking me every question about learning everything that I did and me suggesting these are the kinds of programs that I would need. And he was really brilliant and really lovely, but he was quiet. But I became fond of him over the three weeks. And in some conversation toward the end, I started asking him more questions. And I learned that he was earning his livelihood in two ways. One, he was beta testing software and writing up articles in these computer magazines. Uh, he was installing computer systems for film, a lot of entertainment companies on the one hand. And on the other hand, he was uh, late at night editing trailers for the B movies that came out of Canon Pictures back in the day. Well, when I learned that, I thought, well, so clearly you have an interest in the entertainment space. And then I found he had gone to film school. He let, let me know he had written seven scripts that were sitting in a stack in the corner of his studio apartment that not a single human had read. His father was a, an author, an academician, a, real, a man of letters. So Jonathan came by it naturally. Um, so to answer your question, um, when we met, I read a bunch, several of his scripts and I said, you're really, you're, you're talented. Rather than refer you to an agent, I want to work with you. <clears throat> but these scripts are as good as they are. And as much as they evidence your talent, they're a little bit quirky. Um, and what I would like to uh, have as a means of introducing you in a meaningful way to the community because we all live in a steady diet of hope and expectation that we're gonna discover the next great voice, the next great project, the next great artist. Um, that's a critical energy. And so I wanted to be able to frame him in a certain way and have a certain quality of screenplay. And um, so I asked him, I said, I wanna work with you, but it's not a condition, but I would really like it if you would create on spec a new screenplay. And I would like that screenplay optimally to be a romance. I don't care if it's a comedy or drama. And the reason I chose that is because when you learn about someone's personal story, it, you can zero in on things. And in his instance, uh, he was 23 at the time, quite young. And he had been in a relationship. Uh, he met a young lady when he was 18. And they'd been in a five-year relationship and he was still madly in love with her as she had just left the relationship. To say that he was sad would be an understatement. And not to be masochistic, but honestly, I thought who would write a better romance at this particular moment than this young man? So I asked him to give me a romance. And I said, just a classic two-hander, good male, good female role. No exploding bridges, nothing expensive. Like if I needed to make this very inexpensively independently, we could do that. Um, and that's, so he went away and he came back and it wasn't long. I don't remember. I would say two and a half months with the first draft of what was then called 3000, the script that eventually got transformed into Pretty Woman from drama to comedy. And um, without question, it was the single most refined first draft I think I've ever had held in my hand. Uh, it was really compelling. 
And I knew as soon as, and, and I decided it was so good. I wasn't, there were, I gave no notes and I started to introduce it very selectively. And the feedback was so um, consistently, um, to say enthusiastic would be, people were wowed. So I knew we had the calling card. We had the, the welcome mat to introduce him to the, to the larger community. Um, so I think given, given his talent, he would have gotten there. I think I gave it a nudge. Um, and, um, and that was my sort of specialty was knowing how to present and introduce someone new to the business. So together, I think we, had, we accelerated the process. What a wonderful story. What year was this? Um, I'm going to say it was right around 1984. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I believe. Interesting. Wow. So you saw in him the sort of reserved, maybe genius, but just needed some nudging. And you wanted to see several scripts of his, correct, before you actually made a commitment? He reminds me that what I actually said to him was, let me read one of your scripts, and if I like it, I'll help you find an agent, which was a very genuine um, comment on my part. I would, would have been happy to do so. Well, as it turns out, I read one, and then I said, this is really interesting. Do you have another? And he gave me another. I ended up reading three. Unbeknownst to me, he was being very, I would say intentional, because he was giving me these scripts in the order in which he'd written them. So they kept getting better. And by the third, I said, you know, Jonathan, let's you and I collaborate. I'd like to represent you. I'd like to work with you. And he was delighted. And that was the end of the conversation, other than, you know, what next? Um, so yeah, we, we, we had an extraordinary uh, rapport. And um, I would say that he, people bandy about the word genius quite casually. I would say he was, he was quite, he, he was what would be my definition of a creative genius. Um, and, the, and then of course the next project that he wrote on spec was a result of a lunch that we had together. And the more I dug into finding out who he was and what his life experience was, his family life and all of that, I learned that he had been, he had done, he'd been in the military. I've never been in the military. So to me, that's a very alluring world. It's sort of a fascinating world to me. And Jonathan had um, served in the Coast Guard Reserve. And he did that. He was in active service at the time that the Olympics were about to come to Los Angeles, which was many, many years ago. I have no idea what year that was. Uh, probably the very early 80s, I would think. And um, I started to ask him about what was that? Tell me, what, what did you do? What, where did you serve? Uh, were you on a, I called it a boat. It was a ship, right? Uh, and he, he just sort of regaled me with these stories of what it was, you know, and they had received counter-terrorist training because of the Olympics. So they had a very intensive program. And the more he talked, the more I leaned in. I was absolutely riveted by it. At which point, at the end of the lunch, I said, Jonathan, I need you. I need you. Would you be willing to write a story set in that world? And that was the story that was the foundation for Under Siege. And that's where he learned his uh, IT skills? Was was in in uh, the Coast Guard? Did they <clears throat> did they teach him? Pardon me. Um, I don't I don't know if that's oh, a true I statement. I really don't. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. And did you see where he would write his scripts in this little uh, apartment off Rampart? I saw his apartment, and um, he was on the ground floor, the front corner of the building, with windows facing on the alley. He was right on an on the alleyway. Oh, wow. And the visual tapestry on a day-to-day -day basis was, um, I, I, I don't want to characterize it, I don't want to judge it, but it was a constant parade of police and working girls and drug dealers and pimps and homeless, et cetera. And it was because of the part of town he was in, that was, a, that was just the way it was on a persistent basis. 
Um, so as a backdrop to the original script that was 3000, it was like almost like the perfect input, right? It was because the original was, uh, you know, everyone say, oh, it was very dark. Well, it was it it was darker and it was edgy. But, you know, it's not like people died and, and you know, it was but it but it it refl I believe it did reflect the world he was actually living in at the time. Fascinating. Very fascinating. Thinking back, without J.F. Lawton, how would you attribute your success? Had you not met him, had it not been the right time, how do you see your career being different? Um, well, I'm eternally grateful for having met him. Um, and we did accomplish a great deal. And, and, and not everything that we did, of course, got produced, as is the case for everybody. But... I was really fortunate. I, I came without filters. I came from San Francisco from being a criminal defense lawyer. Um, I had a, a burning desire to be in the film and storytelling business, the visual storytelling business, uh, but I didn't have the knowledge to back it up. I didn't have mentors. I didn't know anyone in LA when I moved here. So I was sort of like this blank slate, a, a, just a big white canvas. And um, so my, my mission was to befriend and just chat up anybody and everybody and make, as far as I'm concerned, the world, I wanted everyone in the world to be my five minute mentor. Um, and then I started, you know, I made the decision to open a literary, uh, shang a, hang a shingle as a literary manager and rented the offices, and got the furniture and got the assistant and got all the, the attributes of it. And I remember sitting one day looking at the phone on my desk with my feet up on the desk, staring at the phone for hours and it never once rang. And I thought, oh, I've forgotten something. I don't have a plan and I don't have a network. And I got busy. And one of the things that was at the top of the totem as a priority was I need, I need to find great people as clients. That said, I was so new that I wasn't sure I, I, I would recognize what, you know, other than we're all great judges as humans of a good story. But in terms of the structure and how it's crafted and all of that, I was still learning. But I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the, my best sense to figure it out. But at the same time, it's really important to me that I find people that I find very attractive as souls, as, as artists, as you know, like there's, a, there, there's something really wonderfully unique about them. And I was fortunate to sign as clients. I didn't actually sign, in fairness, that's not true. I never had agreements. Um, my, you know, my philosophy was very simple. I had to earn my keep every day. I would work hard every day representing someone in, in, in an effort to launch, make their dream a reality. And the, on their side of the bargain, they had to work every bit as hard, not just writing, but making themselves known as best they could, creating their own relationships right on a parallel track. Um, and I did sign, I did sign, I keep saying sign, but I didn't. Uh, so it was a handshake. Anytime they were dissatisfied, they were welcome to leave. Uh, but I had a lot of very long, many year enduring relationships. And it turns out that several of them, Jonathan was not the only great success story. There were quite a few. Um, um, you know, Alison Burnett's done, he's written, been produced 15 times. He's produced a few of those. He's directed several of those, you know, Matt Reeves um, and his then writing partner. Um, gosh, they had a minimal resume. They had some, uh, but Matt's gone on to direct, you know, and produce and write War for the Planet of the Apes. He did the one before that. I forget the name of that franchise or, or that episode. Uh, he's doing the next, the Batman that's coming out next year. Uh, so there's a number of these people that started out with me that were really quite, um, you know, they were wonderful people and they were truly gifted. And not all of them, but quite a number of them went on to have what I would call meaningful, enduring careers.